Hey, kia ora, amazing people. I don't know. Um, I, I just hear from people that aren't part of Agora, which is awesome, who are enjoying uh, the videos and catching up with Jesus through them. So, super cool. Hey, so kia ora, welcome. Um, buenos dias. Uh, como estas? How are you doing? Um, okay, to be here. Uh, Koto, <laughs> how are you all? Uh, doing in the madness of um, of COVID. I'm still <clears throat> coughing a bit, so I apologise for that. I had COVID like six weeks ago. And I still find every now and then I'm coughing or I feel wasted and ah, so frustrating. Anyway, hey, so welcome. Hey, as I often say, I'm good on you for investing in your relationship with Jesus, yeah, and wanting to stay really close with Him or grow closer and and tighter with Him. So you are awesome. Hey, so this is the last in our ACT series, and starting next week, we're starting a whole new series, uh, just looking at some of the kind of key questions that people have around uh, the Christian faith. Um, you call it an apologetics, um, if, if you like that big word, uh, kind of series. So that's what we're going to be looking at over the next uh, six weeks, um, starting next week, which will be a really cool series, and we've got some really cool questions we want to uh, wrestle with and, and unpack and so on. So um, it'll be a really cool Series. It's obviously part of our whole uh, reaching out. So one of our key um, or a key focus of the church this year was to reach out uh, and not just encouraging um, individuals within the church to uh, reach out and talk to our friends and so on about um, their relationship with Jesus, but also a whole bunch of initiatives that we've been doing at church to, um, to reach out, which has been super cool, actually, really interesting. So anyway, Acts. Hey, so this is the last one in Acts. And as I said last week, oh, Makes me kind of sad because I just absolutely love um, the book of Acts. And I was thinking about it this week and I was thinking, man, I feel like I cheat a little bit um, in my job because I get to do what heaps of Christians would love to do but can't, right? Um, so, for example, I get to study the Bible, which I know heaps of Christians would love to be paid to study the Bible. I get to meet with people and pray with them when they're going through a tough time or a good time. And I know heaps of people will be like, man, I'd love to do that. So often I feel a little bit like a, a bit of a cheat as a pastor. Um, but anyway, so one of the things I usually do is I set aside Tuesdays. It's like my sermon prep day, and I try and have no meetings. I try and uh, ignore my email and phone calls and all this kind of stuff and just have the day uh, set aside primarily for um, sermon prep. Um, but it never happens, right? <laughs> I, I'm like the most distracted guy. Uh, I'm not the worst guy ever, but I'm super distracted. <laughs> and I'll be, I usually sit in the cafe, which I know is dumb, and then a church person will come and I'll be like, hey, and I'll, hey, Roz, and Roz is coming in with veggies or something, and I'll have a chat to her, and then Al comes in for coffee, so we have a chat, and then Dave turns up, and it's just like, it's the silliest place to study, or then my phone rings, or then I'm just trying to study, and then I'm like, oh, I should just check my email, and like an hour later, I'm like, no, get out of email, back to studying, so I get, um, yeah, I find, I find even though I have these really good intentions, I get really um, distracted with good stuff. It's not evil stuff, but really good stuff. Um, so just a funny story. This is a terrible story. I was actually, when I wrote this, I was like, oh my gosh, this is maybe an illegal story. So don't get me in trouble, please. Unless you think you shouldn't. I don't know. Um, so I have a scooter, right? And I scooter all over the city on my little scooter. And well, it's not so little, actually. It's quite huge. And um, I've nearly been squashed a number of times, so maybe don't tell Josephine uh, this. Um, although I'll say this on Sunday and she'll be sitting right there, so I'm joking. Um, and two recent times that I almost got squashed were where I'm just totally distracted, right? I'm distracted from concentrating on scootering. And uh, one of them was I had taken a bunch of meals uh, over to um, a, a JCC office, anyway, office over on Kakati Drive, maybe, I don't know, a t five minute, 10 minute scooter from work and had all these frozen meals in this backpack on my back. It was awesome. Anyway, and went there, dropped them off, and it was all good, and then left, and I was scooting down the road. It's a pretty decent road. And I'm cruising down, and I was like, why? And I always have worship music on when I'm scootering. It's one of my things. And so often I'm just worshipping and singing and enjoying the scootering. And I was like, why is this van driving straight at me on the wrong side of the road? And I was like thinking, what an idiot is this guy? And then at the last minute I was like, oh my gosh, it's me. I'm on the wrong side of the road. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and I was totally um, distracted with the worship music and delivering meals. And it was all cool. And then I was like, ah, the guy's face was like, it wasn't angry. He was like, what are you doing, you moron? Like... The wrong side of the road. Oh, idiot. So I'm being way more focused. Um, one more story. This one I thought was really funny. I was scooting to work and I go, anyway, through the city. And I was going down Ward Street by the new environment uh, Wakato building. Do you know where that is? Like, kind of opposite Girls High. So I'm blasting me on that um, street. And I was in the cycle path and I was thinking, I'm being good. I'm being careful. And I'm not being distracted. I'm focused. And then the next minute, this car that was coming... Uh, 
which way, same way as me, just kind of cut across and almost like cut me off and I did the whoa, jumped up onto the, the curb and onto the footpath and I didn't give the guy an angry look, but I kind of gave him a, what are you doing look? And then went and, go, and then I realized, because of course I was in the cycle path, but on the wrong side of the road, going the wrong way again. And I was like, oh my gosh, so. So sorry, man, um, for giving, he got a fright too, and oh yeah, I guess I shouldn't have been there. So, um, guessing that's illegal, I don't know. Anyway, that, my whole point in this is I'm, I need to focus. So I've been making a real point now of being way more careful, and um, I've changed my little path so um, to work through the city, so I'm on illegal stuff the whole time. I don't know, it's just distraction, distraction. Hey, story to say, um, I get distracted on Tuesdays, right, when it's sermon prep day. And I'm just wondering how you're going in your times with um, hanging out with Jesus, hanging out with God. Um, one of the things I've talked heaps about this year and in previous years is the importance of us having some set aside time to hang out with God, right? Some some time, uh, maybe it's in the morning, maybe it's in the evening, maybe it's over your lunch break, uh, maybe it's a special time you have on Saturday, I don't know. Um, just a, a special time where it's just you and God, it may be five minutes, it may be half an hour, I don't know. Um, but one of the dangers is that often we have that as a good intention, but then we're just distracted by things, right? Uh, and something comes up and it might be a good thing and it distracts us away from hanging out with Jesus, which we know is really good for us, right? So so my question is, how are you doing in the hanging out with Jesus, right? Is it going well? Are you find yourself distracted or um, not? Because my, my strong belief <laughs> is obviously if this whole Christianity thing is right, the Bible God, Jesus, cross, if this is all correct, <laughs> then the New Testament makes it very clear that the more I connect with God, the more my life will make sense, right? <laughs> it's not a, not a trick thing. The less I plug into God and spend time with him, the less my life will make sense, the less direction, the less guidance, the less protection, the less care. Um, so I want to try and set aside some time. Uh, maybe each day, uh, maybe five minutes, right? Maybe half an hour, whatever. To just plug in to God and how are you doing? Read a verse or two, or do a little Devo on you version, or spend some time in prayer or journaling. Um, but we so often have that as a good intention, or we get distracted. That's what I'm talking about. Um, it's real crazy in the the section we're reading today uh, in Acts. These guys are super distracted, and not by a good thing, but by this massive, like crazy as. Um, storm. So as I do most weeks, I'd encourage you to stop the video now and read um, Acts 27. We're going to read nearly the whole chapter um, at church on Sunday. So yeah, hopefully you've got a Bible. Um, you can yeah go and grab it, pause the video, grab it and read chapter 27 and then um, I'm going to pull it apart a little bit. Eh? So yeah, let's go. We're going to see this whole distraction thing. So I'm going to pause while you get your... Uh, Bible or pause it and then read chapter 27 if you've got it with you and then we'll carry on. So this is me telling you to pause the video. Awesome. Okay, we're back. Um, so one of the books I was reading when I was studying this week was a commentary by Warren Wiersbe, who's like this legend um, Bible scholar um, guy. He's just amazing. And he had this really cool outline for Acts 27 and I've just stolen a couple of his points because I was like, oh my gosh. So here's the first point stolen from Dr. Wesby. Um, I love this one. Storms often come when we disobey the will of God. Whoa, storms often come when we disobey the will of God. Man, that's so good, eh? That's such a good thing. Hey, let's go. Um, you've already probably been there, so let me catch up with you. Um, Acts 27. I'm just going to read verses 10 and 11 um, here. So again, if you haven't read it, it's good to read it for context. It's a really cool story. This is one of those parts of the Bible where you're like, Oh my gosh, that was so easy to read. It's not like reading, I don't know, Revelation, where you're like, dragons, what's going on? Um, verse 10, men, so this is Paul. Uh, men, he said, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, danger to our lives as well. I love how he kind of elevates it all. Um, but the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain uh, and the owner other than to Paul. And then since Fair Havens was exposed, they, they sail on. Even though Paul's gone, let's not sail on, right? Pretty... Um, Pretty clearly, pretty clearly. Oh my gosh. Um, well, one of the big questions that came into my head here, and when I did, a, I read a whole bunch of commentaries, and no one is able to answer this. Um, no one's able to answer this with 100% certainty. Is is this a prophecy from God that Paul's saying? He's had like a word of knowledge from God, or is he just, he's a very experienced sailor, and 
I hadn't realized this. So by this point in his life, he's been shipwrecked three times already. I was like, that's enough to think. Maybe he's like, no, hang on, guys. I've been shipwrecked three times. Let's not go for four. Are we sure? You know, about this. Um, but one of the books I read said, Paul is a very accomplished, um, not necessarily a sailor, but a person on a boat. And he's sailed all over the place so many times. And he probably knows these, well, he would know these waters really well. And it's possible that just from his experience and from being shipwrecked, he's kind of like, guys. Um, but later on, and, and we're going to look at this um, this verse really clearly, uh, later on in the chapter, he has a, a message from God for um, the, the crew on the ship and the, 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 um, the soldiers and, and so on, um, that no one's going to die. And that's, he, an angel tells him and he, he tells him, right, it's a real clear message. So there's always a question, was this a message from God? Is it just Paul's experience? So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure. But the, the, <sighs> several of the commentators said, he says this with such confidence, they reckon that God's told him, don't go, and you know, or tell the ship guys not to go, because he he doesn't kind of go, hey guys, I think, or hey, from my experience or anything, he just says, if we go, you're gonna die, basically, it's this, and it's like, how's he able to say that with such confidence? So, um, yeah, interesting. Anyway, the whole point in all this is this whole thing, storms often come when we disobey the will of God, and it seems that Paul's had a message from God. That That's the way I certainly read it because of that. He just says it with such confidence. And then it becomes, it's true, which is always a proof of was it really from God or not? Because if it's not from God, um, it, it's not going to come true. If it is from God, it's going to um, become true. And so, yeah, so they, um, they say a lot. Now, I know I'm jumping out of context, but I have to read this next verse. Verse 21 is just... This is just hilarious. Paul is, I love Paul, and I think he's incredible, obviously, but he's quite arrogant. There's quite a few times where he says stuff where you're like, he sounds really arrogant, but the more you read Paul's writing in the New Testament, you realize that he just loves people so much. So I don't think he says it out of arrogance. He just say, says it with such confidence because he's so tight with God. So there's this verse here. Verse 21 is just hilarious. Um, verse 21. Uh, we were, um, no one had eaten for a long time. This is mid-storm, and we'll talk about this in a minute. No one had eaten for a long time. And this is so cool. Finally, Paul called the crew together. There's like 270-something people on here, so it's a big big group of people. And I just love this. Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. And it's just like, it's like one of those things where you're like, he's basically saying... Told you so, Nana Lena. But because he's such a guy of love, I don't think he's saying it like that. But but he's saying what what um, Wesby says is this first point: they disobey the will of God, and everything's turned to custard, right? The, by by this point, and you've read it. You know, throwing the stuff, the um, the supplies over, which was all their money. They're throwing the tackle over, um, all the sails and stuff. They're trying to escape. It's just absolute chaos. And then Paul's like, "Okay, if you listen to me," <laughs> I'm like, "Oh." He's so funny. Honestly. Anyway, I, I, I love it. Um, but there's this clear message, right? Um, when we, we know God's calling us to do something, to disobey the will of God, just not a good idea. Not a good idea, right? Um, Jonah is a, a classic story. Um, I'll just read the, the first couple of verses. I'm sure you know um, the story of Jonah super well. But again, it's this whole... Um, this whole Disobey the will of God, and things are going to turn to custard. He he, he kind of gets pretty smashed. Um, where are we going? Ah, here it is. Um, <clears throat> um, Jonah 1, starting verse 1. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh, who the Jews hate the Ninevites. They are an oppressive nation. They kill, and when they take prisoners, it's hideous. Um, and so this would be quite a repulsive call on, on Jonah, which I think is one of the reasons he, he runs. And now it's my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord, disobeys the will of God. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. Now, if you look on a map, it's really funny, because that's directly the opposite direction, right? Um, he should have gone, uh, let me think in my head, he should have gone east, but instead he goes directly west. <laughs> it's just like, he's out of there. Um, he bought a ticket and he went on board hoping to escape uh, from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, calling a violent storm that broke the ship. Blah, blah. And it's just really great. And I love how the sailors um, figure out it's Jonah and then he comes forward and he's like, Yeah, it's totally my fault. Disobeyed God. Now we're all going to die. And then, you know, chuck me over. And they do, which is quite wild. But 
Anyway, so I point. So I point. The whole point in, in this is to say, man, is there anything you know God's calling you to do or not do? You need to just obey. You know that in your soul. You know if you disobey, it's going to turn to custard, right? So we need to just be quicker to obey. There's a couple of things I'm just wrestling with God at the moment. I know He's saying to do this thing, and I'm just like, oh, it's, that's so huge and hard and scary and avoid, avoid. <laughs> but I know, uh, yeah. I know. Hey, it's a couple of questions um, before you say church or stop and discuss this. You may want to pause the video and if you're with someone, have a chat or just pause it and have a think. I'm always keen to chat. So um, after the one last week, last week, last week, um, a couple of people texted me and said, hey, love the questions, what I was thinking and we've been chatting about it. So feel free to text me, um, Facebook message me, email me. Um, yeah, you can Snapchat me, line me, Discord me. I know there's a million ways to find me. Okay, here's a couple of questions. Storms are hard. God loves us so much. So why does God allow storms in our lives? And I put down, please try and answer this in a practical way. So not um, because he wants to build our character. Like, answer it real practically. What does that really look like that God allows storms? And what's he doing there? Because if he really loves us, why doesn't he just get the storms away? Um, and here's a second question you might want to discuss. I will think about why does obedience not always bring, bring blessing? Why does obedience not always bring blessing? Or do you agree? Um, what, what I'm kind of meaning here is, do you see God as someone who just because you obeyed, he's therefore going to bless or he's even forced to, to bless you? Um, what, what do you think about that? Uh, do you agree, disagree, why? Have, have a little chat about that. So, all good. Hey, so cool, hey? Eh? Cool, cool, cool. Um, there's a quote here from Warren, Warren Wesby from the book that it's a little bit of a side comment to what we've been talking about but to me it's so important I wanted to hit it I wanted to hit it so here it is um, however it was not Paul who was at fault but to this, the centurion in charge of the ship we sometimes suffer because of the unbelief of others now this is such a good point because what he's saying is the it's not Paul's unbelief or Paul's disobedience um, against God that gets them all into trouble because Paul says guys we should not sail if we do you're gonna lose the ship your lives you know it's all this stuff um, but what we've been saying is so often the, the the storm that comes in our life, the hardship that comes in our life, is totally not our fault. It's because someone else in that life brings the storm on us. Um, man, and, and I was writing this this week and I thought, oh my gosh. Right now in saying that, I wonder how many of you are just sitting back in your chair or wherever you're watching this just going, oh bro, oh Craig, let me tell you about some of the... Um, some of the storms that have been in my life because of of the actions of other people, the disobedience before God of other people, or even just the horribleness towards me, and it that causes a storm in my in my life. Um, and and the thing I wanted to say to you is, man, stay strong with God, right? Stay strong with God. Um, storms are hard, right? Storms are really hard, and. I was thinking about it um, when I was writing this. It's like, if you're not in a storm now, there's one around the corner, right? It's what it feels like. It feels like our entire planet is in a storm at the moment. Um, and and that, that key is to stay tight with God. And so here's my question for you. How do you stay tight with God? How do you stay tight with God? What do you do to stay really connected to Him, really plugged in, like I've been talking about over the last couple of weeks? Because there's this... There's a danger. If you're not staying tight to him when you're not in a storm, then when you're in a storm, it's really unlikely you're going to stay tight with him. Does it make sense? So before the storm hits, we need to be working on our relationship with God, spending time with him. We're in the Word, listen to worship music, we're hanging out in nature, we're going to an old church, we're spending time with friends, talking about the Lord, whatever that, that way is that God's wired us to connect with him. And one of the benefits of that is then when the storm hits, we're tight with God, we're good. Does it make sense? Yeah. And, and like, like we've been saying so often, it's not our fault that there's a storm. So you can't be like, well, yeah. And just because you're tight with God, he doesn't protect you from the storm. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, which I wish he did. But he doesn't for a whole variety of reasons, which is what one of those questions was looking at. Okay, so um, not only it, we see in, the, in this, I'm pointing to my Bible, which is my iPad. Anyway, um, not only do we see um, Matt so often when we disobey God, storms come. Um, here's the, sixth, the, the next point. And this one's such a good one. I love this one. Again, I stole this from Warren Wesby. I love this. Next one. Even the worst storms, here we go, cannot hide the face of God or hinder the purposes of God. Oh my gosh. I love that. 
even the worst storms cannot hide the face of God or hinder the purposes of God. Ah, I just love that. I'm like, shot, Mr. Wesby, Dr. Wesby, rather. Oh, so cool. Hey, let's read a few more um, verses from Acts, right? So, again, hopefully you got your Bible. Uh, we're going to read it. Um, let me go back to Acts. I was like, getting myself lost. So, Acts 27, where are we going? 21 to 26. Um, again, if you haven't read it, just pause and, and get the context. Otherwise, it's like, what? What's happening? I'm so confused. Um, so 21, we already read it, but I'll read it again. So there's this massive storm, and it's they. So don't forget they navigate by the stars um, and by the sun. And so when you read in verse 20, the terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars. For them, that's absolutely terrifying because they they can't navigate. They have no idea where they are. They don't have compasses or a cell phone. You know what I mean? They're like that. Um, until at last, all hope was gone. They expect to die, and I'm just like, oh. Horrible, horrible. And this goes on for a couple of weeks, right? Two weeks. Um, so verse 21. No one had eaten for a long time. And this is <laughs> this is this Paul. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Ah, oh, I'll read it not. I always read it like he's a bit arrogant. I'll read it nice. Man, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. Now I read it with him being like, really guys? Oh, that's cool. But take courage. This is the cool bit. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. Now the ship owner's on the ship. And he'd be like, oh, fantastic. Um, verse 23. For last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong. I mm -mm -mm, love that verse. We're going to unpack that. And whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, I love this, God and his goodness has grand safety to everyone sailing with you. Ah, so good. Um, so take courage, for, life, for I believe God. So good, eh? It will be just as he said. And this next bit's hilarious. And everyone's like, oh, this is going to be so good. And then verse 26, but we'll be shipwrecked on an island, which in their time and with their ships would be terrifying. It's like, well, we are all going to die. What are you saying? And, oh, it's quite crazy. It, oh, it's, anyway, there's so much more to the story. Like, where are they expecting to be shipwrecked? Um, Anyway, it, it's, there's just these terrifying reefs and shoals and stuff, and it was one of the worst places to get shipwrecked. You just everyone died because the ship broke up, and then you're killed on rocks. It's, so they're freaking out, um, but they're not even sure where they are. And there's a storm and Paul, and ah, it's all kind of crazy. Um, oh, I love, I just love that God sends an angel, and it's so clear for Paul that everyone's going to stay alive. It's so cool. Hey, so quick story about um, some of my yachting experiences. Um, so I was yachting. Oh man, it was years ago now, and with my father-in-law who had a tiny yacht, um, I think it was, was it 16 feet, it was pretty small, and we yachted from basically Thames um, up around Coromandel, around the top, and then down the other side to, we were going to come in at Waihee at Bowentown, um, <clears throat> and we went for about two days, I was in charge of the food, didn't take anywhere near enough food, so we were starving by the end, but that's another whole story. Um, and uh, we were coming into, trying to come into Bowentown, and a massive storm came up, like massive. So the boat's quite small, and I know people talk like this. I mean, they're on a boat. It's like the fish was this big, you know, but um, the waves were massive. They were way, way higher than the boat, way higher. And we would go down into um, the, the swell, whatever it's called, and the waves, I was just like, oh, my gosh, and waves are breaking on the boat, and it was just terrifying. We are a, a kilometre or more out to sea, um, and there's a, a very clear channel into Bowentown and uh, my father-in-law had a book uh, from some people that had uh, written a book showing what you line up on the mainland um, like you line up this mountain and then this peak in the background and that will give you the channel at certain times of the year and all this crazy stuff so we had this we knew we were coming in but every time we tried to go in we were just getting smashed by the, the these massive waves or we were getting almost pushed onto the shore of Matakana Island, which because the waves were so huge, my father-in-law was like, the boat will be smashed and we might drown and we're freaking out. So we'd try and come in and the waves were just insane and we're getting smashed. And then we'd turn around because we were going into the wind, so we'd do the tacking thing. Oh my gosh. We'd turn around and just <laughs> go flying back out to sea, go way out again where it was a bit more um, calm and then turn around and try and come in and line up. And it was, we were freaking out and I was getting really hurt because I was the main sail that my father was trying to steer, and I'm the sail guy, and they pull this in and do that, and, ah, and I'm getting bashed on the side, and oh, it was just absolute chaos. Anyway, in the middle of all this, my cell phone rings, <laughs> of all things, and I was like, who's ringing? And I don't know why, but I dived down just to see. I think I might have thought it was my wife. Um, 
because they all knew they were staying in Waihee and they knew we were coming in. And it was my brother-in-law. <laughs> it's the funniest thing. He's like a real legit dude. One of those like, yeah, g'day, mate, guys. And he's just like, hey, what are you guys doing? You keep missing the channel. You're coming straight into the waves. Why don't you come in the channel? And I'm like, we can't see the channel. We're going to drown. Ah, I'm freaking out. And he's like, oh my gosh, well, next time you're going to come in, because we were blasting out at this point. He said, I'll stay on the phone and I'll just direct you. And I was like, okay. But I was pretty, not terrified, but I was super scared. Maybe I was terrified. I don't know. Um, and so I was like, okay, bro. Cool. So I gave the phone to my father and I was like, he's on the boat trying to like not get washed overboard um and on the phone trying to phone and then the phone would die because we're getting covered in waves and it would start oh, it was just this is going back years when phones were not as amazing as now um anyway long story short it was quite freaky because we'd be coming in and we'd just be starting to get smashed and then my father would be like oh he's saying we need to go way more to the port or starboard whatever those things are to the left to the left <laughs> and we'd yet over and they'd be like oh no 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 back to the right to the right and it was Absolutely freaky because the channel was so narrow. This there was this perfect channel, and when we were in it, it was still huge waves, but they weren't breaking, and we were doing okay. But the second we went to either side, we were just getting smashed. And one time, these massive waves we'd gone off. A massive wave was coming, so my father-in-law just threw my phone into the hull, into the cabin, cabin, um, because he needed to hold on and steer and stuff. And then. He's like, get the phone, get the phone. And I was trying to get down there and get smell. Oh, I was just going to put Anyway, finally we got in there. Oh my gosh. Uh, and we were, we are okay. And it was all because he was up on the hill directing left, right, <laughs> left, right, left, right. Um, now, Paul, so two things here. There's kind of obvious the application from that crazy story. Two things. One, Paul doesn't have someone on his cell phone going, yo, Paul, where are you guys going? This is where you are. <laughs> go left, go right. You know, he's, he doesn't. But... He does. Oh, he, um, he literally has God. And I know it sounds cheesy, but I was like, man, I only had a cell phone and I only had an awesome brother-in-law on a hill. Paul had God who sent an angel who's like, hey, Paul, you're all going to be shipwrecked, but you'll all be fine. Everyone's going to be okay. And I was like, man, I just love how God cares so much for Paul and cares for those other sailors who are not Christians. They're worshiping idols and sacrificing things and all this. And God loves them. And, protects them and, and cares for them. I just, oh, I just love it, eh? I love it. Um, I'm a bit of a, like, quotes guy. I don't know. Um, love quotes. And I love, and you might think these are cheesers. If you do, bad luck. I don't care. I think they're cool. Um, there's heaps of those quotes around the whole, um, God might not remove the storm, but he will, whatever thing. And I did a bunch of Googling and found a whole bunch, and I kind of reworded some of them. So they, to me, they made more sense because some of them were just weird. And I just, I just got three that I want to read. And what I want to do is I want to read them and just pause for a couple of minutes, minutes, a couple of seconds, and just ask you to just reflect on them. Um, some of them you'll be like, eh. But maybe there's going to be one that you're like, ooh, that's cool. That's me. I need to hold on to that. Eh? So, so here's some of these. Um, God may not calm the storm, but things. So here's the first one. God may not calm the storm, but he will make a way through the storm. <laughs> I love that. God may not calm the storm, but he will make a way through the storm. You may be in a storm now. There may be a huge storm around the corner. Um, he may not part the waves. <laughs> he may not show you the channel um, where you can get through smoothly, but he will make sure you are through the storm because you belong to him, because he loves you, he cares for you. I love that, eh? Here's the second one. Sometimes God does calm the storm. But it does calm the storm, but sometimes he lets the storm rage and calms his child. Oh, I love that one. Let me read it again because I messed it up. Sometimes God does calm the storm, but sometimes he lets the storm rage and he calms the child. Oh, and you, I know you'll have seen that if you've been a Christian for a while. Sometimes everything's turning to custard and you should be freaking out, but you're not. And often someone will even say to you, how are you getting through this? What? <laughs> and you're like, well, I know who's got me. I know who I belong to, right? Yeah, cool. Hey, here's the last one. Um, God may not lead us into the storm, key, key phrase, but he will give us the power to overcome it. Oh, I love that, eh? I, mean, I love the, all the power stuff, the, the power boost in the world. Let me read it again. God may not lead us into the storm, but he will give us the power to overcome it. Yeah, to overcome it. Oh, I love that, eh? Um, 
I know we're a church that really cares for people. We're dropping meals around to people like crazy at the moment who are struggling and meeting with people to pray with them and encourage them and support them and all sorts of crazy stuff. So just want to say, if you are in a storm, you really don't need to do it alone. Eh? Uh, whether you come to a call or not, we don't care. Um, if you're miles away and we could chat on the phone or chat through email or something, we'd just love to support you as we can. Eh? But the ultimate support is God. <laughs> He's better than a brother-in-law on a hill with a cell phone. <laughs> he is. He is awesome. Yeah. Cool. Hey, there's one verse in here that I want to unpack. Um, just just real quick, and this is my fa wife's favourite verse, and probably in the whole of Acts, but definitely in this chapter. And she, she was reading the other day and was like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest verse ever, and going crazy and stuff about it. It was really cool. So I, I love this. Um, this is verse 23, and we read this just before, right? Um, verse 23, for last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood by, beside me. Oh, I just love this. I, I wanted to unpack the whole thing, but I just don't have the time. I love the whom I serve. And there's a key aspect of being a Christian that we serve God. We don't just sit at home playing PlayStation all day or Xbox if you're not called cool. PlayStation, way cooler. Um, or knitting socks. We, we serve God in different ways that he calls us. Um, but, but the phrase I want to really look at is this whom I belong phrase. I just love that phrase. I really do. I really love it. Um, so let me just, I just want to talk about this just a little bit and then, and then we'll finish. Um, so there's a lot of analogies that the Bible uses to talk about us belonging to God. There's quite a few, and I just grabbed three kind of key ones I really love. Um, and the first one is sheep, and I'm just going to read each of these verses uh, and, and make a comment because uh, it's just cool. I, I love being owned by God, to be honest. I'm quite happy, quite happy. So let me read the first one. Um, where are we going? John 10, uh, verse 3. The whole of John uh, chapter 10 is, like, amazing. But verse 3, I love this. It's talking about us being sheep and and Jesus is our shepherd. The gatekeeper opens the gate uh, for him. And the sheep, I love this bit, and the sheep recognize his voice and they come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. Oh, I'm going to read verse 4 because it's so cool. After he's gathered his flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. Oh, and So I used to be a bit of a shepherd back in the day. I had like three or four sheep <laughs> at a time that we was eight. My record was seven at one time. Amazing. Um, sheep are just idiots. And as the shepherd, and I'm, I'm using that word very loosely, right? Um, as the shepherd, it's my job to protect them, to um, to provide for them, to care for them. Uh, when they get um, when they get fly blown, to pick the maggots out and <laughs> spray them with kerosene or whatever. It, it's my job, right? Even though they're idiots and they get their head stuck in the fence and. <laughs> I find it interesting God uses the analogy of us belonging to him as sheep, because sheep are just nutters. We can be nutters sometimes, but God loves us. And he takes his, his job as shepherd to care for us, protect us, provide for us, um, to pick the stuff out of our skin that shouldn't be in there um, very seriously, because you're his. You belong to him. Oh, so cool. Oh, I love that. Hey, here's the next one, children. It's kind of a wild one. Hey, I love this verse. Um, where are we going? Romans 8.15. Romans 8.15. Um, it's kind of in the middle of a section, but the, the verse um, makes sense. Uh, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. I love that. And this next bit's so cool. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Oh, and I, I love this next bit. Now we call him Abba Father. Now we call him Abba Father. So cool. I was talking to a Jewish person a little while ago who thought it was hilarious how crazy Christians go about this, uh, this Abba Father phrase. Um, because they grew up calling their father Abba. That was just it. And then they became a Christian. We're like, you guys are so funny. It's because it was just so natural to them. And they said, um, in their culture, Abba is this real comforting, real close. It's like you know, I've heard before, like we say daddy, but to them it was a lot more meaningful, a lot gruntier um, for that. So it's like, it's real funny that God's one was sheep and maybe we're idiots and he protects and provides and guides and cares for us, you know. And then we have this cool phrase here where we're literally his children. And he doesn't say, and I love how it doesn't say, um, and now we call him terrifying God who I'm really scared of and I'm freaking out about. <laughs> it's Abba Father. It's like we read in Hebrews, we can come into the throne room of God with boldness, with confidence. Why? Because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Why? Because we are heirs with Christ. Why? Because we are his children. Been adopted into, ah, it's just so cool, right? So this, this phrase that Paul says, I'll read the verse again. Last night an angel of the Lord 
Uh, but the angel of God to whom I belong. Mm -mm -mm. You belong to God if you're in a relationship with him. You might be a sheep, but he cares that God protects. But you're his child. We've got to respect him. He is the creator of the universe, but he's also our, other, our, our dad that <laughs> we go to. Oh, and here's the last one. This is kind of a wild one, but I love this one. Because eh? it, again, just brings a different slant. Eh? So First Corinthians 6 uh, verse 19. Okay, here's this one. Um, <clears throat> now, this one you could, at first you're like, what? I'm not property. This is terrible. <laughs> but when you see it in context, it's kind of like, ooh, that's super, I think it's super cool. <laughs> um, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Temple, wow, property. Uh, who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself. Oh, I love that. Why do we belong to ourselves? Because we belong to God. We're his. He purchased us with the blood of Jesus. Oh, I just love all that, right? I love all that. Um, this, this, uh, the analogy that Paul's using here is really interesting. Um, he's often talking about us being sealed by the Holy Spirit. So, and as I'm sure you know, in the time when Paul was writing this, when a king conquered a land and, and took a lot of um, possessions and stuff, he would often put his seal on it, his mark on them, so that everyone knew they belong now to this king. But one of the things he's saying is that it's no longer owned by this other entity. It is now owned by me. It is mine. Um, oh man, there's so much we could talk about there, but but one of the key things he's saying now is this is mine. You mess with this, and you mess with me. Oh, and every time I think of that, I'm just like, ah! <laughs> I just love the fact that I'm owned by God, that I am His property. It's like His stamp is on me. The Holy Spirit is on me, and so anyone on the planet, Satan included, you want to mess with me, you mess with Him, and He's a lot bigger and more powerful and more awesome and more loving and ah! So sheep, guidance, protection, <laughs> picking out maggots um, that shouldn't be there. Um, Abba Father, where is this child? This closeness, this connection. Um, and then where is property? It's a seal. He's mine, you're mine, you know, she's mine. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Oh, I just love that, eh? Hey, let me finish with this quote. This is such a cool quote. I stole this from... Um, uh, Greg Laurie, so I love this. Uh, an older gentleman who was known for his godly life was asked what he does when he's tempted. And he replied, well, I just look up to heaven and say, Lord, your property's in danger. Oh, I just love that. Eh? I love that. Man. Oh, God loves you way more than you will ever understand in this life or the life to come. Way more. Um, and you belong to him. Eh? You belong to him. Uh, you are his. He keeps for you more than you get. <laughs> Let me pray. Yeah, kia ora atua. Man, uh, thank you for this incredible book of Acts. Thanks for inspiring Luke uh, through your Holy Spirit to write this uh, incredible record of the, the growth, the development uh, of the early church. That it does help us figure out all these bits and pieces of where um, Corinthians fits and all this stuff. It's cool. But I just thank you so much for that last verse. And I just pray a real blessing over anyone watching, listening uh, to this, God. I pray the reality of them being your possession, your child, your sheep, <laughs> um, is just so important to them, God. The reality, they belong to you. Mm. Yeah, I love how Paul says that, eh? The God to whom I belong. Mm. Yeah, help us to learn more and more what it means that we belong to you, that you've got us, you have us. We are yours, your stamp is on us. And you say, man, you mess with my stuff, you mess with me. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I pray all this in the awesome name of Jesus that, that brings us salvation. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, all right, kakitano.